hello everybody. So we are from France, from uh, Paris, and uh, we will talk to you about uh, indigenous and scientific knowledge and uh, how together it's possible to observe changes in uh, in uh, in climate and in the environment in general. Um, <clears throat> so me myself, I'm a, I'm a social and cultural anthropologist, specialist of uh, eastern part of Siberia. Uh, and m Mr. Gabishev, that you can see only half, is uh, Randy Herder uh, from Siberia, and uh, he is invited from 2013 uh, to work. Uh, we are working with him in different projects, uh, scientific projects. Okay, so uh, just to say, uh, I will repeat the slide from the, the last uh, lecture for those who weren't with us. So. <clears throat> I tested as an anthropologist two ways of studying climate change. One as a social anthropologist alone. Uh, if you don't know, a social anthropologist uh, is going alone uh, to the fieldwork and try to enter the society to ask questions. It is difficult, uh, I mean, to get accepted by the communities. Um, and uh, alone, I, I, I ask people how they perceive and if they perceive uh, climate changes uh, and uh, how they deal with that. So they uh, have uh, uh, noticed that the, the, the snow period has been shortened of around uh, two months, uh, even more. So the snow is, uh, is coming uh, really later and it creates a lot of problem uh, at the level of uh, hunting, of uh, reindeer herding, and so far. And they also link uh, these uh, climate changes uh, <clears throat> with the changes in, uh, in fauna and flora, like the appearance and disappearance of um, uh, animal species, birds, for instance, uh, the appearance of many new insects, like uh, new flies, unknown horse flies, and also a decrease of uh, many uh, species of uh, animals. So we will come back to this topic later. And um, they also link climate change with uh, problems among uh, domestic reindeer, the reindeer herders, uh, like the appearance of uh, parati par uh, parasitic illnesses, and also about um, this new species of uh, flies are laying larvae in the antlers of the reindeer and it creates infections. So now the reindeer herders need to clean each day of the summer these uh, larvae from the antlers of the reindeer. So in 2012, in 2011, uh, the um, the herders notice another key period in climate change. So how? So third, the first change they notice it from 2005, uh, and it's important. You will see why. And the second key period uh, started with 2011-12, when, for instance, they had a, a winter without snow, almost only five centimeter on the ground. And uh, you will be surprised to learn that it was a real catastrophe because the frost from the permafrost, you know, this uh, frozen ground, uh, permanently uh, for, for the ground, uh, was uh, creating a, a huge frost. So the reindeer were freezing, walking a lot to don't get uh, cold. Uh, and they, they they get thinner and uh, and uh, and uh, ill and uh, many reindeer died in that period. Also, it creates problem uh, for insulation of the tent, the nomadic tent. Okay, so from that period, 2011-12, almost each year brings new uh, anomalies, and it's not a new order, a new norm which is appearing. It's a uh, uh, each year new anomalies. So it creates really a worry among uh, reindeer herders of eastern Siberia. Then another important point is to understand that those people perceive uh, climate change in its, let's say, practical uh, <clears throat> aspects, so the physics of the snow in, in, at, at the level of their knowledge. Uh, and the uh, concrete things, the uh, real things, 
but also uh, they also perceive uh, the uh, the spirits of the natural environment so for them a tree is a biophysical tree or s but it's also the spirit within this tree okay so it's not separated okay uh, what is happening okay so back to this it's important to understand so in at the period from 2005 people said about the weather it's getting hotter in their language uh, a cool and in even and even <clears throat> and um, how to say it's it's not warmer uh, we are talking about climate uh, uh, warming uh, uh, but here it's hotting and then the second period the people start to say the weather has totally changed so uh, the idea of a big disorder and what is interesting is that uh, recently after those studies I uh, learned from uh, from climatologists uh, that uh, they identify uh, two key periods of changes, which is 2005 and 2012-13. So you see, there is really a correlation between what the herders say and what the scientists say. So indeed, uh, from 2013. Uh, we uh, gathered many interviews, and uh, there is a leitmotiv, a sentence that uh, people are telling from the beginning of the interview. You just ask, how is your environment now? And, you, and they say, um, in their language, it is Evenki language, which means uh, the natural environment is broken. Uh, or Buha <clears> on kuchak, so is uh, it means that the uh, the the uh, natural environment just turned it upside down. You see this really idea of uh, loss of logic, loss of norm. Also, they say climate is losing its logic, its manak arche in even language. So just to give you an idea, we compare it we, by working with Randy Herders from 2013. We uh, made a uh, survey of the different anomalies and norms appearing in each year. On the top, you can see the 2000, um, <clears throat> the 2000 from 2011, and we have continued. But it's just to give you an idea that you can see that in red, uh, you see red. Uh, round its years considered to be anomalous, okay, An abnormal. In blue, its year considered to be normal, okay. So you see, there is more abnormal year according to the uh, perception of the Evenki reindeer herders and hunter, okay. We are talking here only about indigenous knowledge of these people. And in the list here, if you can see the cursor. <clears throat> In red, you have the anomalies. Okay, I won't enter the detail, but you see that even in the normal year, let's say, uh, the indigenous knowledge accepts variability. Okay, one norm is okay. If the rest of the year is more or less normal, it's considered to be a normal year. But most of the year accumulates many uh, anomalies. Uh, in the snow cover, in the lunch of winter, in the precipitation, and so far. Also, as I told you, uh, and <clears throat> they are linking the different uh, changes in climate with uh, many changes in biodiversity, in local biodiversity, and they are making a slightly different classification, uh, understanding of uh, changes in biodiversity, they are identifying uh, <clears throat> species that are uh, disappearing, uh, like whitefish. You cannot find whitefish for the moment in, in their local region, which is almost big, uh, <clears throat> or true otter and martin. And now there is a, yeah. And uh, also the decreasing species, um, like roe deer, red deer, wild reindeer, squirrel, and domestic reindeer, it's uh, it's really a problem now. How to protect domestic reindeer from the uh, predators? Okay, uh, the third category is the appearing 
species. So they, they were not in that times and, and they, they are appearing now. So <clears throat> you can see in these many insect species. You can see here the picture of this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, butterfly. Well, they never seen this butterfly before, okay? Uh, and then uh, also many flies, new flies, a new insect, and a big disorder in uh, the uh, reproduction cycle of uh, the insects. And what I'm telling to you, it's straightly from research, okay? It's as if you are entering a meeting of our research group and listening a report, okay? So it's really fresh news. Um, and um, yes, uh, this uh, also each year there is new anomaly in the insect population. Either they are too numerous, either one species is just lacking. So they really notice a, a strong disorder in a, in a, in a species of insects. And then uh, increasing species like horseflies, pikes. Uh, mosquitoes, but also which is a problem for the local population, be the nomads or villagers, is the uh, appearance of the tick born on encephalitis uh, virus. It's a tick wearing uh, the uh, virus of uh, encephalitis, and it creates uh, really strong illnesses that are impossible to treat. And after several years, the the the, the, the person is. Uh, is dying, so it was. It didn't. It did not exist before uh, in this region at all. Now it's a current problem. Is there is even in some sub regions they are talking about invasion, invasion of tick-borne encephalitis virus. Okay, and then uh, yes, yes. Also, what they are noticing also that uh, this tree that you can see here, Pinus pumila, uh, they notice shrubbing. Shrubbing is. Uh, the the vegetal cover is growing up uh, too much from in comparison to the past and where you had for instance too dry in the past you have taiga so you have a lot of bushes of this pinus pumila tree and the 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 large uh, this uh, this typical tree for siberia is growing and growing and growing so the landscape it is changing Тербом тербовки те то саме, тільки на якщо зимою дядька на інге мачер зимою на це тернема кики. And also Mr. Gabishev added for you an information. This tree, the, the Pinus pumila, is a pine, uh, specific. Uh, he is uh, standing up, let's say, during the summer, and it's an indicator of the future weather. So he said, "This is good." Um, yes. Если только просто того, какая температура в течение знаете средняя температура. And uh, they are observing it during the autumn uh, to say if the the level of the incline of it, be it vertical or, or more or less inclined, tells about the future weather. So the more it is inclined in the direction of the ground, the coldest it will be. А если совсем морора на кейте бдир, иман на дарун бдир, значит, это все ими нельзя. And especially in winter, if they, no, they, they, they notice if the, the spinus pumila, it's, you know, that the branches are falling down and covered by the snow. But if uh, a future good weather, so a warming is, is approaching, so the branches will slowly uh, hang up. Huh? Uh, slightly, so they are observing it, and when it, it is uh, hanging up, they know that the, it will be more <clears throat> um, humid, swan, and uh, it will be uh, warmer. Yep. Okay, uh, this is just to say you that uh, very often you have surprise, uh, one of the, sorry, specificities of uh, climate change in uh, Eastern Siberia, and uh, not only. Uh, in, uh, you can, if you're interested, you can read the work of the climatologist Weatherhead, Elizabeth Weatherhead, and uh, she's working also with indigenous peoples, and she is also studying this uh, this question of uh, temperature jumps. So, for instance, in the winter 2015, uh, there was uh, uh, temperatures 
uh, minus 50, 55, 56 uh, Celsius degrees under zero, uh, minus, uh, followed by uh, minus 10, minus 8. So it's really um, it's irregular temperature and it creates problem like here when the uh, the sea, the, the sorry, not the sea, the river ice is weakened by it. And here you have a uh, a sledge with around let's say 200 kilos of uh, food and goods uh, under the ice. So the problem when you have such temperatures to it's extract it and it's uh, in the middle of nothing. You have around no house, no tent, nothing. So it creates really uh, problems. We are talking about this from 2013. People notice uh, an increase of um, extreme events. Uh, so you have seen in winter you have a very strong frost and you have followed by uh, abrupt warming, and then in summer you had a very uh, dry period with drying up of the rivers, flora, fauna. Uh, and also uh, terrible fires. Uh, the, on the picture, it's a fire which has a very uh, a forest fire, very close to a village. You see on the picture, the village is very close. And uh, it was burning for around one month and a half. They couldn't stop this fire. It was just uh, terrible. And sometimes how the, they perceive this is uh, the, the indigenous people are facing uh, climate change together with other changes. So to say, they are facing climate change, changes in biodiversity, and also the uh, gl global changes. So the interest uh, for the Arctic, uh, for its uh, natural resources, and the development of mining, uh, industrialization, urbanization of the Arctic, uh, and the West is also responsible for this, uh, create the different drivers that are having a terrible West on, uh, on, on this community. So to say, here in that case, the people, uh, the reindeer herders, went out from the remote forest because of the increase of predators, uh, really endangering, not only endangering, the predators have killed uh, most of the reindeer, so they came closer to the village, hoping that the wolves won't come to, to them. But close to the village, you have many mines, old industrial sites, with you see the industrial west, which is a huge problem, sorry, in the Arctic. Yes, in the Arctic, there is a huge problem of industrial west and how to deal with that. Uh, if you will, in the future, work in science, please think about uh, this uh, this problem. Um, so it's threatening the health of reindeer. Okay, additionally, uh, the indigenous people have to face many in Russia, uh, have to face uh, many changes in uh, the legis legis uh, sorry, in the law. For instance, from 2009, the indigenous people must pay a, a, a fee for renting the land of pastors. And it's uh, since they need a huge territory, it corresponds to a huge uh, sum of money that they don't have. Okay. In parallel, you have many, many uh, mega projects of uh, extractive industry, uh, dam, pipelines, development, uh, uh, in, now you have a huge in, in investment of China, Russia, the US, uh, France also, uh, which are funding huge development of gas production, oil production, gold production. In all of this is taking is let's say invading the Arctic with create, creating a, a huge uh, endangerment of the environment and, and indigenous peoples. Okay, this is uh, in Russia. They had the, they have in Russia. Sorry, as uh, in almost all Arctic countries, they have uh, set a program of intensive development of natural resources, and in Russia also. And here you have a, 
uh, <clears throat> let's say, an illustration um, of the uh, industrial development planet for the for until 2030 uh, in Yakutia. So the the red arrow you see uh, the two those one were in the past it's completely empty uh, landscape so wild landscape with some nomads uh, moving on it now you have mines and mines and mines and so far so it's just to show you the richness of the ground um, okay. so you have almost everything from diamond gold uranium iron etc etc and of course timber and the market the closer market is China, Korea, northern also, but uh, southern Korea, and uh, you have also Europe for oil and gas. So from both sides of Siberia, you have this economic interest for uh, natural resources. And of course, Russia as a country needs uh, such resources to pertain a certain economic le level. So it's just to see you that there is, to show you that there is indigenous people, in micro scale, let's say, but they are uh, an element of the uh, international political and economical system. Okay, and uh, the idea of of working with indigenous people is also to benefit from their uh, observation, their knowledge about uh, nature, and uh, they are frontline witnesses of climate change and uh, changes in biodiversity. Okay, now, uh, what I wanted to say uh, is to explain you, uh, you are mostly in Adriatic uh, interested in sciences, social one, natural one, uh, sorry, environmental one, um, but how indigenous people knowledge hundreds uh, the studies of climate change. You probably know that uh, sciences, have also and history. Uh, so in the history of uh, study of climate change, there it was there was a shift in the history of climate change, uh, and thanks to this shift, social sciences, but also indigenous knowledge, entered studies of climate change impacts and ways of adaptation. And this shift <coughs> moment is the International Polar Year of 2007-8. Uh, what is the International Polar Year? It's a um, more climatologic event. So from uh, 1882, uh, there was international meeting to, 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 of scientists to talk about climate, what is happening with climate. But in, in 2007, uh, there was a kind of uh, scientists say, okay, what is happening is not only uh, climate, it's also human societies and so forth, far, and we need social scientists and indigenous people to join us to study um, the size, the, 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 the entirety of the impacts. So in 2007-08, uh, all Arctic countries put in one pot uh, money to fund hundreds of scientific projects studying climate change and joining uh, climatologists, um, uh, atmospheric physicists, social, uh, social uh, scientists, including anthropologists, uh, and uh, indigenous people. And it was a really uh, a kind of, um, yes, a place uh, to, let's say, to, to to set up a new science, a new interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary science. So I just wanted to quote uh, an example. Uh, one of those projects was the project uh, EALAT. EALAT is from Sami language. Um, I'm not sure it means good pasture. I think so, but I'm not entirely sure. You have a website. And what is extraordinary with this project, uh, they were really pioneer in terms of engaging indigenous people in research and especially reindeer herding indigenous peoples. And it was possible thanks to this person, uh, <clears throat> Matisse Turi, which is Sami, reindeer herder, 
and a pioneer in terms of uh, underlying the importance of uh, indigenous knowledge. And here you have a kind of science turned upside down because in that case of Ealat, uh, this is Randy Herder's ordered uh, project to scientists and to work together. Usually it's scientists asking indigenous people to do something. Now it's the contrary. So they made uh, a very uh, good work. Uh, some Randy Herder like <coughs> in their Maria era, uh, uh, Randy Herder became a PhD a student. She developed and now she's a recognized scientist all around the world. And they, they, they were really pioneer in many uh, research. Okay, if you're interested in that, they have a, a fantastic website called Randy Herding. Uh, with, uh, you see, uh, there is maps, there is many papers in English, but not only. Just to show you that you see the many places where you can find uh, reindeer herding in the world. Now I will talk about our project, which is not uh, IPY, uh, in indigenous, no, sorry, IPY is International Polar Year Project, uh, but what was done in International Polar Year inspired many projects afterwards, okay? And our project is also, uh, was also inspired from what they have set up. So the project BRISC, which is bridging indigenous and scientific knowledge and uh, about global changes in the Arctic, uh, was joining uh, different partners like uh, National Museum of Natural History, uh, Laboratory of Meteorology, UNESCO and our uh, laboratory uh, with um, the idea to install uh, different uh, community-based observatories among different uh, reindeer herding uh, societies. I won't answer the detail of the other observatories, but uh, we will talk with Mr. Gabishev uh, about uh, the work we did uh, with, uh, <clears throat> uh, in this area you see, so it's Eastern Siberia, it's a huge territory uh, where you have nomadic people, reindeer herders and, uh, and uh, hunters, villagers and townspeople. So in the meteorological map, you see that it's situated on the edge of, uh, <coughs> of um, subarctic climate with dry winter, short and fresh uh, summer. And it's also at the edge of the permanent permafrost. So it's southern, but it's still very cold. So with a, a, an Arctic weather. So now we count six years of experience of community veterans uh, disciplinary observatories with observation of climate change and uh, biodiversity. Some of our results uh, we could um, insert in the international um, assessments on biodiversity. If you don't know, uh, perhaps you can be interested by the intergovernmental platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, it's a huge organization trying to assess the state of biodiversity and consequences of loss of biodiversity for different human groups. Uh, okay, and they are trying to do something with politics in order to generate a regulation of uh, industries and so far in order there will be less um, global impacts of uh, southern countries. Southern countries is Europe, for instance, in, from the point of view of Arctic people. Okay, um, in our, so oh, just shortly, so we compare a different uh, reindeer herding co communities. Uh, we, together with scientists, we studied what is the understanding of extreme meteorological events, okay? And we built up several community-based observatories. Another important aspect of our research is to bring back the knowledge to the youth as you. Uh, you see the children from all the indigenous people uh, of the Arctic, and they are studying in one college. And uh, we are making uh, 
seminars with them and transmitting our publication and so far. And they are all children of friendly herders. So uh, it gives them understanding that the knowledge of their parents, uh, uncles and so far are rich and interesting for science. Work with indigenous people, it means to for the anthropologists to move uh, with them during months, so nomadizing in any possible weather, so be it minus 50 or, or, or plus 30. Uh, we also um, organize meetings between uh, specialists of uh, climatology, so climatologists and uh, reindeer herders in order to uh, train them for making observations. Here, uh, the herders discovered the atlas of clouds uh, used in uh, Russian uh, meteorology, weather forecasting, but uh, in this book, which is made on the basis of European clouds, uh, there is uh, the Arctic clouds, the uh, subarctic clouds are la uh, lacking. Um, also, it means that each day uh, there are observations made by herders. So I want to just show that the conditions of traveling, it's uh, during a, a, um, a storm. Sometimes because of climate change, the, river, uh, the rivers are melting earlier. So with the snowmobile and all the sledge stuck in the in a mix of snow and water, etc. And we work together with uh, one person, which is key person. She is uh, a former we weather caster and uh, even key person, so owning uh, a part of the traditional knowledge. Sorry. <coughs> now, oh, yeah. Okay, so we have now 50, uh, 75 months of daily observation of climate, but also for the environment. As Mr. Gabrichev told you, they are looking at this pinus pumila, uh, this spine, uh, to predict the weather. Okay, so they are observing uh, almost each part of the natural environment to predict weather, to observe weather and climate. And uh, you can find it all around the world in indigenous knowledge in African country, in India, people look uh, the presence, absence, uh, behavior of birds, for instance, to predict the weather, etc., etc. We have also many mappings, and we documented also the uh, <clears throat> a part of the indigenous knowledge. So I pass quickly. You have also, for those who are interested, several atlas of community-based observatories. As you can see, uh, there are many observatories in Alaska, Canada, and some in Greenland. Uh, many also. Uh, in uh, Northern uh, Europe and a uh, few in uh, in uh, Russia. So uh, we also, so with Randy Herders, published a set of publications, uh, papers, and a big book. So it's it's not very spread to uh, put the name of uh, the main contributor for indigenous population as a co-author, which is which should be a norm. Huh? Uh, but uh, I see that now there is a trend to acknowledge uh, the input of uh, indigenous people by marking the authorship. Just to show you that in the book we published on the uh, knowledge system about the environment from the five years expedition and gathering information. And you see here that uh, we identified in this knowledge um, a different typology uh, of natural landscape, of topography, of uh, vegetal cover. Uh, there is also an indigenous science of climate. Uh, we found it, and there is many diagrams. It's not an invention of social anthropologists. It does exist. A cloud topology, precipitation, but also what was surprising for me that they have a, a thin understanding of the invisible, so the circulation of cold, coldest, warm, warmer air uh, in the landscape. And also uh, a snow and ice typology very developed, as you could see in the film. And at the end of the book, uh, <clears throat> it's an exercise, everybody can try to, to understand it. Um, it we show how they use those typologies and concepts to analyze their 
what what is happening in the environment uh, from norms to uh, anomalies. Okay. Just to say that indigenous knowledge can continue to live without any scientists. In many places, it uh, it it happens. Today, there is uh, still a lot to be done in documentation of uh, traditional knowledge, and it's extremely difficult for Westerners because there is a need to know the language. And if you have this possibility, relatives that have this indigenous knowledge or this local knowledge, uh, I really encourage you to do it, even in the classroom, for instance. Uh, okay. And yeah, what is important is such book can be uh, used by scientists uh, or by uh, inter international assessments, for instance. <coughs> um, as you can see here listed, it can be also uh, because it's uh, written in also in indigenous lang language, so it can be used uh, by indigenous youth and also by you uh, at school, if you wish, to try to make an exercise uh, to raise public awareness among the youth and the future actors of this world. Huh? Okay, I will switch this one. Because we must finish close this one. Tara, we can yes. So <coughs> yeah, we'll go check out. Green, green. Okay, we have no time. Let's yeah. Okay, let's come back to the snow typology. So here you have the um physics of the snow we identified with all the analysis of uh, of the analysis they made of different snow covers. Uh, I followed them and we, they make also diagrams and so far and I gathered everything in two tables. You see surrounded in uh, in red it's anomalies. So what are the conditions of transformation uh, of the snow type? So I leave the floor to Mr. Gabishev. He will explain uh, diff three, uh, th three case studies here. I will uh, show with the cursor. Mm -hmm. Uh, if, uh, he, he will explain if you have on the top of the um, mm. snow cover the snow chuyur, which is a hot snow from the wind from the storm. Uh, and, uh, uh, after that, if you have a slightly warming, not too warming, he said, plus uh, a snowfall, in doesn't matter, any snow, all s possible snow type, and then you will have... Uh -huh. And the, um, so the, 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 the snow on the surface and the former the former Tuyur, which was a hard snow from snow, will turn back to a dry and soft snow. So you see, it can recover a previous state. And if there will be a harsh cold uh, a frost, let's say, with uh, minus 45, 50 something Celsius degrees, so he said it will turn into another type of snow, which is buldo, it's like icy flakes. Yes, later. Yes, target is there. Man, Arago can just be Arago can only can be can be. What is the reason for why the Zawat num karasho? And if you have uh, a lot of bulldoze snow, the icy flakes, and with a progressive decreasing of the temperature in spring, so a slowly melting of everything. So you will have a good uh, vegetal cover, and it's good for all uh, animals of the forest. And sometimes, Tara. Uh, let's talk about the transformation of the chera. Mm -hmm. Chera, uh, you, you have heard about this snow in the film. So chera is a sky-like snow created by a successive um, slightly sowing and refreezing. 
so it creates a hard layer. So if you have this, if you have a, a snowfall of dry and soft snow, do you kun called do you kun in uh, warm? When they say warm, it's minus twenty. Uh, if you have so, I uh, will So then, do you kun of So if you have so. The uh, the the chera, this uh, scab-like snow, which is bad for reindeer, will turn back into uh, duyukun, so dry and soft snow, which is good for animals for reindeer. And if you have the the harsh cold with minus 40, uh, 45, 50 Celsius degrees, so this. Uh, dry and soft snow will turn into buldo snow which is icy flakes you know the good snow uh, it's a good snow for vegetal cover in case you have it's a second line different types of snow then you have a warming kind of minus 10 something and it's uh, or five and you have a mix of snow and rain together which is called uh diamond mm -hmm. uh, you have as a result what they call teparkon imanna which is wet and porridge like snow so it is kind of mass of wet snow which is gluing sticking and which is you cannot do anything with that. I mean, you cannot really mm. move on it. And what the the worst thing is when it's coming back to the frost. This porridge, like snow, is transforming into a kind of snow, very hard and uh, like concrete, which is very bad. <coughs> And um, when it's also bad for the snow because um, when it will um, uh, melt, so it will uh, melt very quickly. So it will bad. It will be bad for the vegetal cover. And it's bad also because if uh, melting too quickly, so the um, the seeds of the vegetal cover will be exposed to the um, frost of the night, and they can get frozen, and there won't be any harvest. And so, if in that case, the animals. And the birds will run over, uh, run away from this area, and it will become an anti air area. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a study they made uh, in their daily observation. Sometime they are making in, at their own initiative. I mean, Randy herders an analysis of snow cover. So let's start with this. Okay. Uh -huh. So in um, so by seeing this snow cover when where we see only white snow, they see different layers and they can identify the different weather and the period the snow uh, fold or get transformed into the States. So they identify that this blue uh, part I show you with the cursor is um, fold in October. It's uh, sticky, uh, sticky snow called teparenemanna in their language, uh, and uh, it became hard. It uh, hard and compact manga imanna afterwards within already within the the, the snow cover. Uh -huh. 
And uh, yes, he is repeating that it became it hardened within the snow cover. On on the top. Uh -huh. On the top of this hard layer, which is an anomaly, you see the red stuff means anomaly. Uh, there was a fold in November, December of do you queen mana so uh, normal snow so soft and dry snow and you see uh, an, an additional anomaly he said is uh, you see it's very deep for for the the, the region and this deepness it do not give the frost to cross uh, the snow cover and to transform this uh, this hot uh, snow into buldo. You remember this good uh, icy flakes, uh, which is good for the vegetal cover. And you probably do not know about it, but snow has a role of insulation, which is crucial for vegetal cover and the physics of the snow. Mm -hmm. You see, there was another anomaly in, uh, when the, in autumn when the, the first snow uh, fall, uh, the, the ground was not frozen that should be normally. And this is an anomaly you can find among the Sami people also, uh, that snow cover get installed with a not frozen ground. And here you see that it creates uh, <coughs> an empty space. Um, and uh, the uh, warm air and the damp uh, transform the, the snow in uh, half lit sod uh, into something sticky. And it couldn't be transformed in this buldo uh, snow because of the very deep layer of snow, which creates an insulation from the frost coming from the air. So it's instead of being transformed into buldo and make free the vegetal cover, uh, it just stayed like that, and it's bad for reindeer because if they eat this, they will uh, uh, get ill. Okay. What a So this is another analyzer. So you see here it's likened. Okay, it's pictures taken uh by uh, herders and they, they show that so you see he it's so it's another type of snow which is installed during the autumn so it's fall, fall, falling let's say and then because of warm, warming of the autumn it's sowing embedding the vegetal cover and freezing like this so you see here lichen is embedded within icy blocks Mm -hmm. And um, in case of uh, norm, so the, the harsh frost of minus 45, 50 can reach these C, this is blocks of uh, small ice embedding vegetal covers. So the, these blocks will be transformed into bulldoze, so it will. Uh, like here, you see, it will make free the lichen. Here you see the ending of lichen free from ice. Here the process is not finished. And this is why he said the snow bulldog is so important for us because uh, it's uh, freeing the vegetal cover embedded within uh, within bad snow, and um, if not, the reindeer, wild reindeer, um, domestic reindeer will eat uh, lichen together with ice, and it's very bad for their stomach. Mm.
Uh, we probably finished. Can we, if we can continue with one example? Yes, you can. Yes, please go, go ahead. Ah, bon. <laughs> bon. Uh, bon. <laughs> okay, so this is another exercise. So just let me remember you, remind you that it is not environmental science. I mean, European one. It's really traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is norm for understanding anomalies. We need to understand what should be. What is the norm? So uh -huh. <coughs> So he said, oh, for those who doesn't understand this, he's talking in even key language. So the norm is to have a not too deep layers of snow. Here you have two layers of snow. If you see my cursor, mm -hmm. you have this famous bulldog. We are talking about it. It's icy and sea flakes, uh, the very needed uh, snow type. And on the top you have this duyukun, so the soft and dry snow. They are not too deep. And you see here the frost crane across these layers of snow and reach the ice. And by this cold, the ice is getting um, deeper. No, that is the joke of the He is say, saying that the, 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 the ice is getting uh, deeper, stronger. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and under mm -hmm. this, you have waters. Water. Mm and and um, also the deep layer of ice uh, is isolating uh, and and how to say the the water is cold. I mean, it's cold. Is the degrees of cold, of course. <laughs> it's very so, so so if you want to have a look on the text of norm in English, here it is. Uh, oh, everything you can find in uh, our book, we published this, uh, which is accessible in open source uh, from a link, uh, link I can give you. So it's good pedagogical exercise, if you wish. <laughs> okay, so here is an anomaly observed in 2000. 1415, so we have seen the norm, and now we are studying the anomaly. So, Usually, what they call Ulan, it's uh, water uh, flowing from under the ice. Uh, and here you see that there is no water between the uh, ground and the ice. So water which was under the, um, the ground, so the sources, let's say, couldn't go out normally and went out through the bushes. So he said, uh, the water is going out through every possible path where usually air is circulating. Water was circulating through the bushes. So, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see here um, on the top of this ice, you have duyukun, so snow, so soft and dry snow. Uh, you can see mm -hmm. here, and it was uh, it was very 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 uh, deep with the rule of insulation. Literally. So on on the top of this duyukun you had water uh, under the hard layer of snow, so the tuyur, which is a hard layer of snow created by storm winds. So you had this with water under it, and it created a porridge-like. Kasha, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, which was just impossible to travel along with. 
Itar cuyur ki bukan tangat kita kat tangatan ni kan itar ayam mana tau dan biji dia berkasar. He had that this here you see the little waves. It's water mixed with this uh, halfly sown duyukun, so this kasha, this porridge like, and the uh, deepness of this layer of chuyur, this hard snow, didn't give the frost. You see here, the frost cannot uh, cross these layers and freeze the water. And it's also dangerous because when you see the landscape, you do not know that there is water under it. So you just go with your snowmobile and just crash in it and you are stuck in it. He said it's a terrible problem uh, for moving by snowmobile and by reindeer also. If you stuck in such porridge, uh, you cannot really extract your sledge. It takes the entire day, and it's also dangerous because the other, the temperature outside is minus thirty, forty. Prostan, prilipai tamnat. And uh, the other problem is that this uh, porridge, like snow and water, is sticking to the sledge and to the snowmobile and it's freezing what is getting outside so it's getting twice or four times heavier than uh, than it, it is without this so it's terribly difficult and dangerous mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. ah okay just um we must finish anyway. Um, this is another example to show you that not only science and here, here you are really in uh, in two research because uh, it's uh, it's a position we have. Uh, it's not shared by all the scientific community, but I think we have proven in this book uh, that definitely uh, <clears throat> indigenous knowledge is also making prediction modeling. If you don't know, modeling is how to try to predict several years ahead how we look the climate the biodiversity etc it's to model okay and the idea the, the spread ideas about indigenous knowledge is that indigenous knowledge is only located in one place and is unable to make uh, modeling let's say and it's described as like practical knowledge uh, while it is more theoretical in our point of view. So don't take it as a prayed and accepted by everybody, but just I wanted to let you enter research. So here, it's uh, you see, uh, in 2014-15, the notice of several anomalies, like warm winter, and you see here they are drawing the consequences, which you can look at it, with uh, deep snow, so the ice on the river is very thin. You see, if you follow my cursor, you see it's good for fish because uh, they can feed everywhere, everywhere under the ice. There is more water. Uh, uh -huh. It is bad for transport because uh, the uh, ice can break under sledge or snowmobile. Uh -huh. You have also <clears throat> a sea. You know this uh, icy snow embedding. Uh, um, uh, vegetal cover and then also uh, this is bad because reindeer cannot really uh, reach the uh, lichen and it's also bad for hunting uh, because doc uh, cannot run and coach stable uh, and um, stable cannot graze really because of deep snow so what you can notice first is they observe uh, several anomalies they make deduction so and consequences as you can see the green are positive one the white are neutral one and the red are negative one so observing this what are they doing they are modeling so what are they modeling so from here everything you see on the the, the part have appeared is hypothesis uh, is hypothesis made by 
herders. So I took uh, discourses of uh, herders, and this is all you see, the complexity. They have observed warm winter, so the, they know that it is possible that spring, you will have uh, early spring. If so, you will have bad transport, etc., etc. So they are from here making hypothesis modeling, let's say, on the next summer, autumn, etc. So you see that you have uh, good aspects for, sorry, for the cones of Pinus formula. You remember this tree, which is uh, uh, moving with the seasons. Uh, you have also good, uh, etc. So just to show you that there is a hypothesis with different possibilities, like in science, okay? If A, if B, so C, okay? This is strictly the same. And finally, I think we can finish on it, is how anthropologists and indigenous, uh, anthropology and indigenous knowledge can interact. You have here the indigenous people communities, which have, when they have, still have it, indigenous knowledge, which helps them to adapt, okay? Together with indigenous, uh, with anthropology, they can transmit uh, to the international scientific community where you can find different science, okay? Uh, a part of this knowledge in a specific way, as we try to do and, and other people do also. And it can be what is interesting included within international assessment, IPCC is about climate and IPBS is about biodiversity. And in a wonderful world, <laughs> Um, it's possible to give message to the policymakers, the governors of the world and the governors of the state, to try to adapt economic politics or industrial politics, to try to have a, a less heavy imprint on the climate and on the herd. So this is from small uh, indigenous communities living with the environment, how with different sciences, and in our research we had also climatologists and uh, atmospheric physicists, how working together, indigenous people and scientists, we can try at least to transmit something through uh, international assessments and try to give a message to the international politics, but also to you, use uh, the future actors of this world in order to just dream about a better uh, a better imprint uh, on the on the world. This, this is why science is useful. So how people say in uh, Siberia, bye bye. They say live well. I am a mad video Bye. <laughs>